things just seem to doesn't make sense. And, you know, silver did make a nice move last year, 50, 50% up in a, in a year. But then in the last eight months, we are going sideways. And at the same time, we are hearing, you know, we, if you want to buy physical, you have to pay huge premiums. In Europe, uh, you can get it for less than 20% premium, uh, more, more like 25, 30. And then we are hearing like people can get their silver from their unallocated and pool allocated accounts. And the price doesn't go up. It's actually going down. Right? What is going on with the silver market? Well, hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcadia Economics on Wednesday afternoon, April 14th. Certainly an exciting day in Silverland. I know I've said that before, although when you see what happens later at night, I don't know, maybe you'll agree. Um, so good reason to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell because there will be some breaking silver news tonight. It can involve the CFTC or a rally in Washington or a specific cause designed to elicit some answers or truth or just have fun with the whole process. So again, you'll want to stay tuned for that because there will be more coming throughout the night. I promise it's going to be fun. And fortunately, yesterday, I was invited onto Rand Gavrielli's channel, where we talked about silver, some of the things going on in the market, and um, really asked some great questions, and I had a few things to say, so kindly letting us repost on our channel here so that you can see. Um, so thank you to Rand. The link to his channel is in the description field below, so I'd really encourage you to go check it out. If you love silver talk, um, and someone who's taken the initiative to bring truth to the world, help spread this message. And uh, certainly, I really had a pleasure meeting Ran. And if you can go uh, check out his channel, if you enjoy what you hear, I would certainly encourage that. So with that said, let's dig into some silver talk. Hey, guys, in today's video, I'm going to discuss the economy and the silver market. And, you know, in the last few weeks, we have had uh, very uh, interesting developments in that market. You know, with the, the price reached high in February, and since then we are a little bit low. But, um, and also all the information that came out with uh, what's going on with the Perf Mint and with the unallocated accounts. It started with the Perf Mint. Now they're also talking about uh, Kitco. And um, today to discuss uh, the silver market, I have uh, Chris Marcus, he's the founder and host of uh, Arcadia Economics. He's also an author of uh, the big silver short so uh, this is going to be a very interesting interview um uh, thanks for coming chris uh, thanks for coming on the show well thank you ran uh, appreciate you having me I, I appreciate that you're taking your time to share what's going on in some of these markets uh Certainly a bit different than what we were told growing up and free market, American, Uncle Sam, land of the free and honest and all that. And so I think it's uh, certainly it's why I left Wall Street voluntarily without another job in place, because I thought it was that important and uh, appreciate you having me here today. And hopefully I can help in any way possible. Um, yeah. So I want to ask you. You know, in the last year, we have seen, you know, it's been a crazy year. And now again, in Europe, at least in Europe, we are seeing uh, all the countries are going into shutdowns. And generally in the last year, people didn't work and they didn't produce anything. They didn't, you know, give services. At the same time, they got unemployment checks from the government. Uh, from money that was printed, uh, you know, from the central banks, uh, from the Fed or from the ECB in Europe. And at the same time, we are having the stock market in all time high. Uh, mm -hmm. Things just seem to doesn't make sense. And, you know, silver did make a nice move last year, 50 50 percent up in, uh, in a year. But then in the last eight months, we are going sideways. And at the same time, we are hearing, you know, we if you want to buy physical, you have to pay huge premiums in Europe, uh, you can get it for less than 20% premium, uh, more, more like 25, 30. And then we are hearing like people can get their silver from their unallocated and pool allocated accounts. And the price doesn't go up, it's actually going down. Like, what is going on with the silver markets? What are your thoughts about that? 
I think those are great questions. Uh, they're the same ones I ask. And I don't know, I spent 11 years on Wall Street. So I have this little trick that I use. And I don't know, it's not legal financial advice, but maybe someone will find it helpful. It's like when you hear someone saying two plus two equals negative 36.4. And you say, I don't understand that. Can you explain it to me? And they say, send a check and then disappear. Or they don't answer follow-up questions. Or you, or they just say that or tell you you're stupid if you're even questioning such profound logic. Um, usually those, I've, in my experience, I've, I've found are the signs of a Ponzi scheme. You know, so it's if you watched any of those great movies about Bernie Madoff, I mean, it's not like people couldn't find it. There was uh, Harry Markopoulos, a uh, fund manager who was supplying the SEC with evidence years in advance. They knew about it. It wasn't a mystery. Now you can debate why they sat on the evidence and ignored it. Was it because of politics? Was it because they were profiting off of it? Was it because the whole thing is a rigged system? Um, similar perhaps to what you saw, uh, if anyone's uh, watched that movie Goodfellas a couple of weeks ago, and it was interesting because, you know, they beat someone up, but then, you know, the same police that the, the person would say, hey, I, I got I got attacked here. But if this, the guy who beats him up is also slipping the cigarettes with a box with a box of cigarettes with the hundred dollar bills in it. You know, it, it does leave people confused. Leaves people very confused, uh, left me confused for a long time. And there were a lot of things that never added up. And that was eventually why I left Wall Street. Um, because there were a lot of these questions that didn't add up. And I, I thought it was odd. I've gone to worked at Moody's, Mickey Mouse bond rating agency that I might add still has US Treasuries rated as AAA. It's basically negative yielding credit. It's an, a bigger Ponzi scheme. That's that's according to Moody's Investor Service. That's the U.S. government is the there's no credit that's better than that. So, okay, you know, again, maybe I'm disqualifying myself because if I spent two years at an agency that corrupt and incompetent, which you also sell that scene in The Big Short where they showed the. Did you see that movie, Ran? Yeah, The Big I Short. Did. Remember the scene where uh, they go down to s &P and there's the old woman that looks like she's not, with all due respect, have the same computing processes as these banks. And she says, well, if we don't give them the rating, they go down the street to our competitor. And that's yeah. the same thing I heard Moody's say while I was there. Another quick note about Moody's. I didn't know what a CDO was when I graduated college in 2001 uh, and joined Moody's two months before... Enron imploded, which they were involved in, and three months before September 11th, and I was running from the dust cloud. But remember, everybody in Moody's wanted to be on the eighth floor where they raided the CDOs, and I'm guessing that was because they were making a lot of money. But so again, maybe I'm confused because I went there. Then I went to Wharton's Business School, where I sat there with crazy Doc Brown. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Jeremy Siegel. It's like the Doc Brown mixed with from Back to the Future mixed with Keynesian economics. <laughs> Ranting about the productivity if the Fed just prints more money. Here's another investing rule for anyone watching. Uh, try saying it out loud. And if it's hard to say it with a straight face. So basically, OK, the economy got destroyed. <laughs> but those same banks have been like robbing and stealing for decades. They're going to print more money. They're going to make sure it's okay. And we don't need any oversight. That sounds a little unusual when you say these things on loud, out loud. I mean, so then uh, after uh, Mickey Mouse, uh, Wharton, which I wish I'd saved the receipt for, was trading equity options. And it hit me when the whole thing collapsed, like, aren't I the guy that should have been trained to see this? Although, I don't know. I mean, eventually you hit someone over the head with a shovel enough times, they wake up. And I think the world has been hit over the head with the shovel. But when you have, well, I wouldn't say reputable dealers like the Perth Mint, fraudulent dealers like that, where they send people like Richard Hayes out to lie, 
and then I call and say, "Hey, or actually, Rand, I don't want. I don't like you. Gotten into the whole power of positive thinking, so I want to stay positive. But maybe you can help explain this to me. If Richard Hayes of the Perth Mint goes on to the air and says, "We have plenty of silver. Any of these keyboard thumpers <laughs> that are talking about silver conspiracy theories might add he's insulting his own customers when he says that." Guy should be making a fortune right now. I don't know what he's so pissed off about. But he says there's plenty of silver. Yeah, everything he says just made it look like more suspicious. So, well, well, here's, here's what I don't get. When I act, you know, hey, I like to be fair, not make assumptions. So I called the Perth Mint and I'm asking and they, they mentioned, I think it was the kilo bars. So there's a limit. Uh, I, I said, I noticed there was a limit on the website. I'm like, why, why is there a limit? She said to make sure everybody can get some. But if Richard Hayes said there's plenty of silver, why, why do we need a limit to make sure everyone can get some? I, does that seem odd to you, Ran, or am I missing something there? Does... I don't know. If, if, if I was um, a dealer sell, selling silver, I would want to sell as much as possible. Most, most of the time... Make a discount. Would... I would make a bigger discount if you order like more more bars yeah most businesses like making money especially when conditions are good and they're making a lot of money instead of like insulting their customers typically they say hey yeah here buy more buy more we have plenty unless they're lying which i i as i was progressing through this conversation with the perth man i said you know hey i'm not trying to you know, blindside anyone, but I said, frankly, what you, what this woman was, was telling me, I said to her, frankly, what you're saying doesn't make sense. It's in direct con contradiction with what your boss said. And I mentioned, I have a show. I get tens of thousands of people who ask me these questions or watch the show, many of whom send emails. I'm up late at night answering the questions for the Perth Mint and I can't figure it out. Does, does, does Dick want to come on the air and, and answer any of this? All of a sudden, then she tells me, well, he already did his interviews. He doesn't have anything else to say. Hmm. Oh, the old lion hide. So lie about it. Hope nobody notices. But here's the thing. When you try that for decade after decade, eventually people aren't that stupid. Someone rolls along and says, hey, well, you can lie all you and want. He made but... uh, only an interview with this um, Australia 60 Minutes, which is uh, they, don't, they don't really have a good reputation for being honest. They are doing like, they did a hit piece on uh, Peter Schiff uh, not too long ago also. Well, apparently the last thing that the Perth Mint uh, uh, Twitter account was active for a while said, hey, you know, we're bringing this guy in to take pictures. I'm bringing an auditor. They didn't comment on, on the least metal. I don't, Ran, I don't know. If, if somebody accused you of something, let's say they accused you of some crime that you, you're like, you didn't, you didn't do. And they went out and they were saying this about you and spreading it on Twitter. And everyone was, you were getting messages. People are really like, hey, you're a bad guy. I don't know. Would you be okay with that? I would try to clear my name. I would be really angry if uh, someone did that. So how come the Perth men, ever since any of these questions have been raised, they, they, they sent a photographer to take a picture of the medal. But there's John Adams, who's sitting there talking to customer after customer, I think a lot of people weren't sure because John keeps reporting this stuff. And they're like, no, this couldn't really be true. Then I start getting the messages. I mean, people are emailing me and now I'm following up with the customers. I'm following up with the Perth Mint. And I actually said to the woman that I was speaking with, I said, you know what? If you want, you can put me on hold. But I'm telling you that it sure seems like your boss is lying. I'm trying to be fair and give him a chance to answer the questions that I can't answer that people are asking me. So if you want to put me on hold or you do want to message him or contact him, I'm giving him a chance to tell me what I'm missing, to defend himself, clear his name. Because There's a lot of people. There's a lot of evidence that looks pretty damn fraudulent. But she wasn't interested in that. She says, well, I'm going to pass along the message. And then I was realizing, I said, ma'am, do you remember what my name is or where I'm from? And of course she didn't. She had no idea. So I said, if I hang up now, 
for what I've just told you about what I'm accusing your boss of and what thousands of people, including your own damn customers are seeing. If I hang up, what are you gonna tell them? Some, some guy said this? And, and she said, mumbled something and I said, and she was like, well, what is it you want me to do? I said, I don't need you to do anything. I don't want you to, I don't care what you do. You've already told me all I need to know. But out of respect, if there's anything else you want to ask. So it's kind of like hinting, like, if you want to ask, you know, I'll give you one more chance to ask to, like, at least show some fraudulent interest in caring about this. But if there's anything else you want to ask before I hang up, here. She says, says okay, have a good day. Might yeah. add, uh, I called JP Morgan, got the same response. I called Goldman Sachs. It's amazing. You can call their investor relations line. I'll bet they'll take your money. But if you accuse their bosses of being complete fraudulent criminals who are dirty, dirtier than dirty, <laughs> they're cool with it. Maybe because they are. You know, hiding in plain sight. The old lie and hide. It's Wall Street's move. But it's kind of interesting when you know someone is bluffing. Hey, hey, maybe they're not bluffing. But if I'm willing to put my chips in there and call it, and we'll see, come, we'll see who's right. Yeah, so and do you think that most of the unallocated accounts, they run the same scheme? I, I, we have heard about Kitco. Also, the news started to come that there is a one-year waiting uh, to get silver from them, from people that uh, are paying for storage. It doesn't look good. It doesn't sound good. And hey, you know, it's like, I get it. You know, someone says this or that on Twitter. So, so I hear uh, John Adams passes a lot of these things along. I, fo I followed up with someone last week. <laughs> I talked to the guy for a half hour. He didn't <laughs> seem like he was making it up. He was telling me about how he called. Actually, I'll leave this to uh, your audience, Fran. Call Kitco. Ask how many uh, ounces you can buy. See if you can buy more than 5,000 in uh, bar form. The gentleman I talked to said he couldn't. Yeah. He, he, and he had about like 4,000 ounces and he was, and he was mentioning he was concerned because of the stuff he was hearing. And they said they had like, uh, you know, 3,500 uh, ounce bars. It was like somewhere like, <laughs> basically if he had taken all of his metal, <laughs> that would have cleaned out their supply. He wasn't sure how many coins they had. So they could have more coins. But this guy told me, he's like, they, it was like three, 4,000 ounces with what they told him. And they said, otherwise it might take a lot longer to get his metal. And then I had someone from Australia that I've met before. So I'm getting a lot of these things. I don't know. Hey, maybe people uh, are making it up. Uh, uh, you told me to account. I'll tell you, I got the emails. These are the conversations I've had. And call the Perth Mint. Call Kitco for yourself. Ask these questions. Uh, or show up. Um, I've uh, ranged. I have some bullion dealers who are able to take larger orders. I mean, it's on my list of things to do. But I mean, when you call and they give you a much different answer than what they say on the radio and then they don't want to talk about it and they won't give you your medal I, I i mean i i'm not i'm not in their business I'm, I'm gosh darn grateful i don't run an operation like that but as someone who has spent the last 12 years studying this and thinking this is this paper silver market is enron the paper silver market is bernie madoff and just, all right, what were the signs right before those things were about to go? Um, a lot of them, in my opinion, are happening now in the silver paper silver market. Yes, and, and let me tell you another something uh, that I heard lately and was very interesting. Now, in the silver market, we have these like black holes, you know, like the SLV, like these traps. So uh, investors go into there and there will be just endless paper um, so the price doesn't rise. But then I heard an interview with uh, Rick Rule. He did it uh, like uh, three weeks ago. And um, he said something very interesting. And I almost didn't see anyone covering this. Rick said that the PSLV uh, bought all of the silver from Toronto 
and from Ottawa, and then they went to New York and they drained all the silver from New York. And then they went to Boston and they drained all the silver from Boston. And then he said that basically now they, they are going into Europe. They are going to uh, UK and uh, Switzerland and, and Germany. And they have to bring silver on, on ships across the Atlantic Ocean so, so they can back the PSLV. <laughs> and, and then he says that they are the biggest buyer of silver in the world. <clears throat> But then he says something interesting. He, when, when they ask him if there is manipulation, I don't know, maybe he wants to sound politically correct. He says that there is, he doesn't think there is long-term manipulation. He thinks that the market is manipulated. You know, everyone knows that suddenly in the middle of the night, uh, someone is suddenly selling like tons and tons of silver and it doesn't make sense. It's like they're trying to lose money. But then on the other hand, he basically said that he depleted all of the silver in North America, you know, in, in big quantities. So the way that I add, you know, one plus one equals two is that we are having massive shortages. And right now there is opportunity basically because of this manipulation that the way I perceive it that is going on to just accumulate silver on super cheap prices. Um, did you hear like, uh, and then at the same time, like we see SLV added like, uh, I don't know how many millions of ounces last month. Uh, do you think the SLV is, uh, you know, is not legit? Like should, should investors be concerned with, with that? I'm concerned. I wouldn't touch it. There's a lot of signs for concern. Um, I mean, we could, could talk for days about the signs for concern of SLV or why they changed their prospectus in the middle of the night in between uh, sending out this puppet figurehead from Goldman Sachs named Jeff Curry, whose appearance has changed quite a bit over the years. But in either case, whichever guy they sent out committed a couple felonies when he lied and, and impacted a market. There's no question about that. Actually, uh, I think, Ron, I'm, I appreciate you letting me share that here. I like saying it as directly as that because now, uh, now that I've been thinking about the last couple of days, that was a similar felony that occurred on February 2nd, arguably the single greatest demand of, his, of silver in the history of the planet. And the price fell 10%. Um, so I'm going to be doing some legal action on that one and have fun nailing Jeff's lying ass to the wall. In a peaceful, uh, respectful, appropriate manner, of course. But, you know, I think these guys just have fun laughing at everyone's face, showing how arrogant they are, bragging about it, and uh, assuming anybody else is too stupid to ever understand just how fraudulent what they're doing is. But, again, I would compare it to that scene in The Big Short at the very end, where the bonds had already started to default, Yet the insurance was still cheap. And then Michael Burry goes in there and they finally adjust his marks and say, oh, we, we're looking at your marks. And Burry says, actually, what I think you meant to say was that now that you've established your own significant short position, you're going to finally price the thing appropriately. And you see that. And then you hear the bankers speechless. It's kind of kind of that you hear him give the same responses Dick Hayes gave. Or uh, I don't know, maybe but at least that. Goldman Sachs gave me on the phone that day when I told them that I thought their commodities chief was completely fraudulent. Um, although it's fun, ran, I did email someone I know at CNBC and asked her if she was aware that every time he opens his mouth on their channel, commits market felonies. So we'll see how that goes. Um, but that's the thing is that fortunately, I'm not a lawyer. I don't have subpoena power. I don't really want it. Um, but I think when you run a Ponzi scheme that's highly levered, you don't need any of that stuff. In fact, you don't even need like a lot of people to change what they're doing. If even like a few people stop feeding new money into the Ponzi scheme, collapses really quickly. And that's exactly what I expect will happen with this one. In fact, I, it, I believe it's happening now. I believe it happened on February 2nd. We're watching the cover up continue and, uh, like many things that the banks do, uh, it's not particularly well executed. And I don't know, I guess you can uh, rig the judicial system so that people like John Corzine, instead of going to jail, just start a new hedge fund. But, you know, people aren't as stupid as bankers think they are. And I'm 
happy to be a part of at least showing what's really happening and let people decide for themselves. Yeah, the it's the channels like like yours and the, also what I'm trying to do with this channel is to bring people the truth, but also to to explain to them how can they uh, benefit from from what's going on. Now, I would like to know uh, what is your uh, what do you think about mining uh, silver mining stocks? Do you think uh, people should be in uh, in those investments uh, or not? Or is silver a better investment than uh, miners? Well, I like to hope I'm slowly wising up and don't use the S word of what anybody should do because that's usually a recipe for disaster. Um, I share what I do. Again, to be clear, I'm not a licensed financial planner. My background was trading equity options and I think of myself as a silver analyst or show host or entertainer, conspiracy theorist, whatever words one chooses. With that said, I am a big fan of the silver mining stocks. And yes, you know, if all goes according to plan and if you have a company that has a good project, is run well, is doing honest business, has the experience, the intellectual knowledge to know, you know, there's good people out there. They're doing, doing good stuff. And I think that when the silver price goes up, a lot of them are going to do really well. Again, keep in mind, you know, there's a difference between an ounce of silver and a share in a mining stock because, you know, if you have an explorer and they never end up finding any silver, it doesn't, well, ironically, maybe it does matter. I mean, you still have, my guess is when this finally goes, you know, there'll be like companies that like silver refrigerators, you know, just has it in the name <laughs> and they'll get bid up. But yes, I, I, buy mining stocks. Uh, I buy options on mining stocks, which is incredibly risky and I've gotten clobbered on while the price has been smashed for the last decade. So I don't advocate that in most situations, but that is what I do. And, you know, I think it's one of those things very similar to the big short. You're going to get your ass kicked for a really long time but if you, you get paid, but you will you get paid. structure your bet so that you can stay solvent longer and it's positioned in a correct way. Um, you know, I think that we'll see something quite stunning, similar to what those guys in the movie did. I can't guarantee that, but that's, uh, that's what I do personally or aim for. Okay. I think that's a great advice for anyone who is watching. Uh, guys have some silver miners, but uh, don't go crazy on them. The silver, you have it in your hand. It's something physical. It doesn't have any loans or, uh, any promises it's just there and mining stocks have uh, a lot more potential but a lot more risk now uh, i know we're running short on one time. other on a, one other part to that please uh yeah sure yeah something that even more basic in investing that i've found helpful i've heard a lot of folks mention i love listening to philosophy and trading books and you know also thinking about what i've experienced uh, I think there's a lot to be said for matching your investing style with your personality. So that's why I, I try to be clear to phrase, this is what I would do, which, you know, I worked for a trading shop that I personally would bet on over any other trading shop in the world in any sort of gambling competition. Not to say, I don't know, there's maybe someone smarter out there, but these guys knew what they were doing. They started the shop because they were really good at statistics in college and they would go to the racetrack and, and win because they understood the math better. And they understood the puts were mispriced, the skew to the downside in 1987. And that was really how the foundation, they won big on that. I mean, there are certain things that, you know, you just approach in a certain way. Um, so, I mean, it, it, it's helpful and that, that's it, but that's, a, I guess my point, that's a different background than, you know, if someone's a doctor or they're an accountant or I, I was trained as like a poker player. They, these guys were poker players. That's how they trained us to look at the options, which, you know, there's a time to be aggressive and then there's a time to take the single or the double where the ball is pitched. But again, it's going to be different for each person. So, you know, for some people just buying silver is appropriate. For some people buying the miners, and it doesn't have to be one or the other. 
Um, you know, again, I'm sharing and that's why, again, I'm careful how I phrase it because I have a different background than most people, you know, also right now, my situation, I, I have a business, I'm fortunate is going well, you know, I can buy call options each month. If they expire worthless, I can live with that because I know my longer term plan and the risks that I'm willing to take, which is different for each person. So, um, again, I, I would say more than any, not forget about silver, any asset, you know, if you don't know anything about silver or you did all this stuff seems boring to you today, but you love technology, then you probably have more insight. What are people missing there? So whatever you're interested in, and then developing a plan based around that and your skill set and what the expertise you have access to is, is always a good starting point, I find. Yeah, that's, that's a good advice. So if I would um, uh, put it into one sentence is, guys, if you don't understand something, either learn before you start investing in that or just don't invest in that. W would you agree with that? Yeah. I mean, geez, that, you're not even just investing, but I mean... With business, with anything. Anything. If you're yeah. bored by it, don't get a job that you hate. <laughs> <laughs> True. That's that's I I not just saying, I mean, I've gone through this process. I was working on Wall Street. I hated working there. Although I love the stuff that I am doing now. And it's but it's been intriguing where you know I had to go learn marketing, which is a different skill set they don't teach you. But if you love growing potatoes, but that's your favorite thing to do, I mean fine and take your knowledge there's other people there's millions of people buying but there's there's markets for any of these things and when you start with what you're genuinely interested in that i find is the key that on the days where it's not going so well you're frustrated because you really care about it you can keep going that's why things have gone well with the silver channel because it's before we were making money with you know, my partner and i it's like it just was the darn most fascinating thing I've ever seen. And now that the idea that I get to do a YouTube channel and talk about it and that people benefit from it, they, they appreciate it. They find it helpful is, is, and then I get paid to do it is, I think that's the American dream, not this crap we were sold about go to some socialist college, get grades and stuff where they, you don't get, you don't become a doctor by healing people. You got to get the license. You got to get what their manual says. Yeah, and, and then the buy a house and pay a mortgage for the next 40 years. Yeah, and this psychiatric field where they I guess they're up to the DSM-5 now, but, you know, manual like, hey, if the guy does this, give him this drug. If he does that, give him that drug. And if you find out that those drugs maybe aren't the best thing for people to take, they're not going to give you the license for sharing that. The same way that when I was on Wall Street and started realizing, gee, there's something going on with gold and silver, you know, you don't get promoted to Goldman Sachs for talking about gold and silver unless you're lying about it and telling people why they're a conspiracy nut job for buying it. Um, so I get it why that's a lot for people to handle. I mean, it's not, this isn't a quantitative financial analysis. This is the greatest mass hypnotic thought experiment in history. I mean, this is the same thing the Nazis were doing. You look at the infiltration, I mean, this is George Bush, their Brown brothers, Harriman financing the Nazis. Then they start the CIA. They, they, they become president. They I just read this book called The Bush Crime Family. I mean, it's like decade after decade, one Bush after another. And I don't have a better opinion of the Clintons either. In fact, I watched this great uh, film by someone I consider a true hero, that if there ever was someone worthy of being a president, a man named Aaron Russo, he was documenting a lot of these things, pointing out how there's actually no law that actually requires you to pay income tax. So there's another felony uh, scam. But he was mentioning yeah, it was like that, that, that think... one. I know that uh, Peter Schiff's father, Erwin Schiff, he in the end he yep. sat in jail for for mm -hmm. saying the truth and for being a patriot, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's how the uh, the U.S. government that's supposed to protect its people basically. When someone exposes their fraud, they, they, they use brute force. That's, that's, that's their true character. That's who Uncle Sam is. He steals from you, and when he gets caught, he puts a gun to your head. 
to intimidate no, everybody else. <laughs> but I don't want to live like that anymore. So at least I'm going to say what's honest and right. And um, I don't know, I guess I'll uh, take my chances, but it's disgusting. It's pervasive. Absolutely. And now we have silver getting manipulated. There's the CFTC who's been claiming to uh, regulate the market. I call <laughs> bullshit on that. They're not regulating anything. And perhaps uh, before we wrap up, I'll just mention we are doing a peaceful expose the CFTC fraud and corruption rally. We're going to aim right by their office, but that will be next Tuesday, April 20th. And uh, we'll make signs. We'll have a great after party. Um, but I think a lot of this continues on because people feel afraid to speak up about what is true and what they know. And um, I don't know, maybe I should or shouldn't, but at least I'm, I'm going to let go of that fear and do what's right and uh, accept whatever God has planned in my life. Yeah, uh, I am totally with you on this page. Um, for people who are watching the video and wanna, if you know, if they wanna find the uh, find out about you, where, where can they find you? Well, you can find us at arcadeeconomics.com. We also have the Arcadia Economics YouTube channel. Uh, I suppose those are the two main places. Uh, I, I know you mentioned, appreciate you. You got a copy of the book, Big Silver Short, which was designed. So that if somebody, I know there's like a lot of stuff out there, but if somebody wanted a single document that puts this into context, I might add, it wasn't just me writing it, but I did it interview style format because that way you really get to hear not just what I think, but all these other I've 15 interviews with the most uh, knowledgeable silver experts that I could find. And that's what comprises the book. Um, and fortunately, it seems like people have been finding it helpful. And uh, either case, if people have questions or need help with any of this stuff, you can find us at arcadeeconomics.com. Definitely. And, and um, guys, I can vouch for the book. It's going to be probably a historical document uh, containing what the biggest experts in the silver field uh, were, were telling us, uh, you know, they were, what they were telling us what's going on. Uh, before uh, before the scheme will uh, will un will unravel. So um, in one place you can find basically uh, the the biggest the experts uh, in the field and uh, what's their opinion. Like Chris just made it into one point for you. Um, okay, Chris, thank you so much for coming on, and uh, I hope we can do it again sometime. Well, thank you, Rand. I, I'd like to just end with, I sure appreciate what you're doing and that, that there are people like you that care about this and are helping to get the message out. And thank you for that. And if there's any way I can help, please let me know. Uh, thank you, Chris. So there is tonight's episode. Hope you enjoyed that one. Again, I'd really encourage you to go check out Rand's channel. Uh, if you liked what you heard, subscribe and uh, follow what he's doing. Certainly anything to get the message about silver out, I think is relevant and helpful. So with that said, I appreciate you being here and click in the link coming your way now if you want to know what tonight's big announcement is.